hey everyone, we're going to read chapter 10 today. Um, I hope you guys are having a good week, a good day, a good night, whenever you're watching this. Um, okay, the questions today, pretty simple. Be listening for a simple sentence, a compound sentence, and a complex sentence, okay? Um, if you can't quite figure out if it's complex, compound, try your best. Um, we can go over it during office hours if that's something that you would like to do. Um, so come and hang out with those. Um, and then you need to answer the question, would you behave the same way that Johnny Raven is behaving in this chapter? Okay, that's going to be, that's going to come into play big time. Um, and then let's see. Oh, the last page of this um, packet, you're going to be kind of comparing and contrasting all three characters. So what does Gabe look like? What does Johnny look like? What does Raymond look like? And how do they act and stuff like that, okay? Again, if you're having problems, having trouble, um, come to office hours, that's why they're there. Uh, I'm more than willing to help you guys out, okay? All right, here we go. Chapter 10 of Far North. <coughs> Excuse me. We wasted no more time talking. We never even agreed to it in words. We looked at, looked at each other, then scooped up the things we needed. The axe and the bow saw, the parachute cord, and ran through the forest, then down the portage trail around the falls. We went straight to the giant drift pile on the beach. The falls had stripped off every branch and even peeled the bark from some of the logs. We selected logs seven or eight inches in diameter, cut them free, and hauled them downstream to a sandy spot in the shore that was mostly out of range of the drenching mist from the falls. Some of the logs that looked good turned out to be completely waterlogged, as in so full of water that they would sink, they wouldn't float like what they're trying to do, which is make a raft. Then we started laying logs across the top of our rectangular frame, lashing them down. It was going to be a crude raft, that's, that was for sure. About 16 feet long and 12 feet across. Okay, uh, that's the vocab word that I want you guys to look up. Crude. What does that mean? Okay, it is spelled C-R-U-D. Use it in a sentence or uh, use it in your, uh, your dialogue this week. Um, see if you can fit it in at all. Okay, crude. What do you think? We had half the deck logs in place before we slowed down enough to start thinking about how we were going to steer it. Johnny could help make us oars, uh, Raymond said. He makes canoe paddles for people all the time. It's got to be birch, I know that. There's birch near our camp. He could pick the right ones. They're going to have to be pretty long. And we'll have to row standing up, side by side, one of us on each oar, don't you think? And what about oar locks? Oar locks took some figuring. Now, oar locks, okay, they are Y-shaped, like, like stands, okay? So if this is the end of the, um, of the raft, so this is the raft, and this is the oar lock, okay? It's shaped like a Y, okay, and it's tall. The oar fits in between the Y. Okay, so it's a way for the oar to sit in between and move, right? Move like the oar needs to move without it slipping out. Okay, so that's what they're trying to figure out how to make. Raymond got the idea of making them from stout Y-shaped branches in the shape of giant slingshots. The oar would, would rest on the fork of the Y and the fork would stand a couple of feet above the surface of the raft. Raymond looked around quickly, then pointed to a thicket of bushy trees he said were alders, over by the switchbacks at the bottom of the trail. We ran over there, found the forked branches he envisioned, and cut out our oar locks with the bow saw. All the time we were racing, knowing that the Chinook wouldn't last. By the time darkness was falling, around 3.30, right? That's like the middle of the afternoon and the sun is setting. We were nearly done with the raft itself. We had a little more work to do on the oar locks, but we could do that first thing tomorrow, maybe while Johnny worked on the oars. We'd been working in such a frenzy, we hadn't even thought about being hungry. We started up the steep trail that led to the top of the falls. The old man wasn't in camp. 
Maybe he got a moose, Brandon said. Either that or something's happened to him, I said. I grabbed the flashlight, which by now wasn't worth much, and we started upriver. About a mile from camp, we saw a dark shape coming our way. The old man's parka hood was thrown back. We could make out the patch of snow white hair. You get a moose? Raymond asked him. Johnny Raven broke into a smile. Moose, Johnny repeated, bringing his hands close together as if to say small moose. First I thought he was saying he'd shot a small moose, maybe a calf, but then he started leading us back toward camp. Maybe he only saw one, Raymond said, disappointed. We began to wonder how we were going to explain to Johnny about the raft. Once back to camp, the old man collected the skinning knife and the whetstone, the frying pan, a couple of cooking pots, and the red wool blanket. Raymond and I looked at each other, wondering what was going on. Johnny threw some rose hips into one of the pots and arranged the other ones in the pack sack. He motioned for us to follow him. He really got one, Raymond exclaimed, beaming. He got a moose, and he's taking us to go eat at the moose. Sky high with expectation, we followed the old man upstream to the carcass of an enormous bull moose. I just stood there, astonished at the reality of it lying dead right in front of us. Johnny had already gutted it. Here was a mountain of meat. The antlers measured at least five feet across. Now, that is massive. I am five foot five inches, so I'm only five feet or five inches longer than these moose's antlers. So these, it's, it's huge. Okay. I let out a victory whoop and asked Raymond, how much does this moose weigh? Over a thousand pounds for sure, he replied. Maybe a lot more. How come he said it was a little one? Raymond bragged, or Raymond laughed. That's just like those old guys. They never brag. It's bad luck. I was already wondering how we were going to get all this meat down to the raft. We couldn't afford the time. The Arctic air could come back and freeze the river real quick. The old man was skinning the moose by the flickering beam of Raymond's flashlight. I got a fire going with a butane lighter and some shredded birch bark from my day pack. Uh, like the old man always used to. Or always used. By this time, I'd caught on to always having some handy. The birch bark caught quickly and flamed hot, giving off black smoke from the, all the resin in it. Johnny Raven brought over a big hunk of fat, which I started melting in the pan, and then he returned shortly with the tongue of the moose indicating I should cook it in the pan. It wouldn't have been my first choice. Raymond cut thick fillets for us from the tenderloin along the backbone. We skewered them with sticks and roasted them suspended above the fire. The moment a piece began to look about halfway cooked, I removed it from the fire and sliced it into thin strips with my pocket knife for Raymond and me. Johnny, we could see, was waiting for the tongue, which was sizzling and spattering in the pan. I started wolfing down huge mouthfuls of meat. Johnny reached over and touched my arm, cautioning me to slow down. I followed his advice, chewing more slowly, but the meat was so delicious, and I was so hungry, I kept eating until my stomach felt like a cement mixer. Then I drank some tea. Should we tell him about the raft now? I asked Raymond. I think we should wait until tomorrow morning, he said. I kind of hate to make him think about anything else. Just let him enjoy his moose. Raymond and I returned to the brush teepee. Johnny spent the night upriver by the moose, sitting by the fire and keeping guard. Against wolves or bears, Raymond said. People say bears can smell something dead from miles away. The warm Chinook kept blowing, 40 degrees above zero, even into the night. So far, our luck was holding. A couple of hours before first light, we built up the signal fire and headed back to the old man. We wanted to eat some more of the moose and then get the oars made as soon as possible. As soon as we'd eaten our full, Raymond began to explain to the old man what we had decided to do. At first, Raymond tried in English, speaking slowly and simply, but he had to give that up. Then he quickly gathered up some little sticks, snapped them into lengths, and made a model of the raft. I kept watching the old man's face as Raymond acted out a rowing motion. Just that quickly, the old man was wagging his head. No, he said. No good. 
He pointed straight at the ground. Camp here, he said. Try again, I told Raymond. He doesn't understand that we could get all the way down the river. Get out of here. Raymond tried again, but old Johnny Raven understood perfectly well. He started talking rapidly in his own language, shaking his head all the while. He went back to he went to the bank of the Nahani and came back with a big chunk of ice in his hands. He set it down squarely in front of Raymond's model raft. What's that supposed to mean, I asked. I guess that will be stopped by ice, Raymond said. I guess he's saying that the river will freeze up again before we get out. Well, what does he think we should do then, I asked, all out of patience. I think he wants us to move camp here to the moose. That's what they used to do in the old days. In the winter, they would move to the moose someone had killed. They'd stay there until they'd eaten the whole moose and tanned the hide and so on. We'd have to build another brush teepee here. The old man stood up and spread his arms wide, then imitated the sound of a droning airplane motor. Apparently, he still thought we were going to be rescued. What if it doesn't come? I shouted. I know, I know, Raymond said. Even so, he thinks we should stay here. I guess he's thinking we could make dry meat from most of the moose to preserve it and just wait for the airplane. Along about Jer January? That would get real old, I said. The old man's eyes, which usually were looking away, were now looking from Raymond to me and back. He was wild with frustration, not being able to talk to us. He reached for the rifle and emptied the magazine shells, three of them. Then he held up three fingers. What's that supposed to mean, I said, showing us he killed the moose with one shot? I thought they never bragged. Raymond said, he wants to make sure we know he still has three left. I guess he's thinking, hoping we can get a lot more meat. The, sh the old man was pointing upstream. Moose, sheep, caribou, he said in English. Then he pointed downstream and he made a sh cutting motion with his fingers right across his throat. Raymond said, looks to me like he's saying that down in the canyons, there won't be any game. Upstream, we can get more meat. So what's more important, I sa asked hotly, being where there's more game or getting out of here? I don't know, Raymond said slowly. I guess that's the question. How long would this moose last us? I don't know exactly. Maybe a couple of months? And the river breaks up in early May. What are we talking about now? Spending the winter here? I guess that's why he showed us the shells. Johnny must think it could be done. From the corner of my eye, I spotted some motion. It was a raven flying from the top of the tree to the ground by the moose. The huge black bird was looking at us carefully with its slanted black eyes, then looking back at the moose. It took a few hops closer, looked at us again. The old man paid little attention to the scruffy-looking raven. I said to Raymond, You said you have to be a lucky to get a moose. What if his luck runs out? It would be just like back in the old days, Raymond said. Sometimes people starve. He knows that. He was there. I started counting on my fingers. November, December, January, February, March, April, May. I could see the uncertainty in Raymond's face. He wasn't sure I was right. He was actually considering spending the winter here. You've got to be kidding, I said, and I could feel my face flush. You just admitted that we could starve to death. These old guys know a lot, he said defensively. We should at least listen to what he's saying. You can't even speak his language. Raymond turned away, like I'd hit him with a whip. Look, I said, trying to calm down. Take a look at the river, will you? It's running open. His eyes were digging a hole in the ground. I know, he said. I noticed the raven uh, tearing at a scrap of flesh sticking out from the hide. I picked up a hefty stick and heaved it at the raven as hard as I could. I almost hit it. The raven protested with a loud squawk as it rose with heavy wing beats, landing back in the top of the spruce. The old man was distressed, biting his lip, looking from me over to Raymond. 
don't ever do that, Raymond snapped, looking at me as if I was a stranger and an idiot. Scare him off, but don't hurt him, Raymond said. You scare him off next time, I snapped back. I was all worked up. I reached for the axe. I'm going to make the oars myself and finish the raft, I told him. If the river's still open when I finish, I'm going to go. I'll take a little of the moose meat, and I'll take one of the waterproof boxes for my sleeping bag. I'll just take a few things. You guys can keep everything else. Spend the winter back here? I don't think so. I'd rather take my chances on the river. I want you to come with me, Raymond, but if you decide to stay, no hard feelings. Raymond walked away and sat on a log. I stood there waiting. I knew he wanted I I knew I wanted him with me. I need him to help manage the raft. The old man was cutting scra scraps from the carcass and flicking them over toward the spruce. The raven swooped to the ground and started hopping around them, picking up the scraps and swallowing them whole as the old man spoke to the shaggy-throated bird in his language. At last, Raymond stood up. He went to his great-uncle, not to me. He said, I'm sorry, Johnny. I'm not like you. You used to live out on the land. Maybe you still can. Maybe you just think you can do it, even though you only have three bullets. You aren't so young anymore, Johnny. Maybe you just want to live the way you used to one more time. I know how you elders think it must be much better back then. That's what you're always saying. But this is now. Don't you see? The old man may not have understood the words, but it was apparent from the mournful expression on his gentle face that he understood completely that Raymond had sided with me. He looked older than ever. In immeasurably sad. Okay, he said softly. Okay, Raymond. To my surprise, the old man got up, came over to me, and made a short speech to me in his own language. I was struck by his frailty, yet awed by his great dignity. For a moment, I was ashamed that I had won. Uh, he put his hand out. I started to shake it, then realized he was asking for the axe that was in my hand. He's going to help us make the oars, Raymond explained. He's going to come with us. That's the end of chapter 10. Okay, so what do you think? Is that a good idea? Is it not a good idea? Um, is it, do you think he, they should have stayed? Do you think they should go? Was Johnny right or is Gabe right? Okay, I want you guys to kind of talk about that and think about it, all right? I hope you enjoyed that chapter and I'll see you guys later. Peace. Bye.